Okay, can I ask you all to please put your arms in front of you? I'm going to offer a series of statements, and I'm going to ask you to answer with your hands. So two palms up is yes, two palms down is no, one up, one down is maybe, or I don't know. Okay, here we go. Ready? First statement, one. It is acceptable for the government to use violence in certain circumstances. Yes, no, or maybe. Two, it is acceptable for schools to use violence as punishment for students. Three, it is acceptable for parents or guardians to use violence as punishment for children. Four, spanking is a form of violence. Five, spanking is acceptable. Okay, great. So what we just did there was use simple physical motion as a way for everyone in this room to simultaneously express something about their beliefs. We, you, we made your collective thinking visible by giving it physical form. And this is a form of choreography. And what we just did is a choreographic strategy that I used in two projects that I'll describe in a moment. So I'm a dancer, which means that I've spent the last 40 years thinking physically, coming up with choreographic strategies to make things visible and to make things possible. But when I first started uh, working in conflict a few years ago, I rejected out of hand the idea of using any arts-based strategies because I thought I would end up with kind of a watered-down, ineffective version of both practices. But what I discovered is that trying to create the separation between these two practices that I'm already part of was not only a bad idea because I was throwing out a lot of good information, but in terms of choreographic practice, it's not possible because our bodies are where we live. And so they're automatically involved in any conversation that we're having, whether or not we're conscious of how we're choosing to engage with them. So conflict is already choreographic. So choreography, to choreograph means to organize things physically. And these can be to organize ideas physically. These can be ideas about the body, as in dance, or they can be ideas in other realms of discourse. So in dance, it can work, for example, like this. Let's say I decide the choreographic strategy I'm going to use is that I'll walk forward and move my arms in circular patterns. And then let's say I add the idea that every time I see the microphone, I turn my head to the left. So my dancing changes according to how the choreographic strategy focuses my attention. So that's dancing. But choreographic thinking can happen in any realm of motion. For example, four years ago, I was um, sitting in a cafe in Germany where I've lived for the last 27 years, and I was talking to my husband and collaborator, William Forsyth, who is a choreographer. And we were talking about an aggressively anti-immigration book that had just come out, and we were asking ourselves questions about immigration, about the dialogue that surrounds it from both a choreographic and a conflict perspective. And the project that emerged from that is called Not a Not, and it became the first in a series of projects that I've been working on. Public dialogue models that rely on physical action, choreographic strategies to function. So since then, I've led 12 Not on Not events in four cities in Germany, engaging over 1,200 people, Muslim, Christian, immigrant, East German, West German, on the topic of immigration. And a recent um, event we did in Berlin, we were invited by the city to help try to create connection in a community where fascist groups have been mobilizing attacks against a new refugee center. And I have an image in my mind from that evening of two women who came into dialogue. Cornelia, a German woman who was crippled in an attack by a fascist group in a different situation. And she talked about how as a result of that attack, she can no longer connect to the idea of being German. And Rosa, a Russian-born German uh, woman of German descent who suffered as a child growing up in Russia because she was called a fascist. 
And she talked about how, as, as an adult, she decided to move to Germany because she feels German. And for her, fascism is something separate from that. So in speaking about their experience, these women spoke about identity, they spoke about nation, they spoke about culture. And these are the things that I hope for in this, in this project. And it was made possible in part by a choreographic strategy that I'll show you in a minute. Um, I am preoccupied with the question of what it would actually take to reduce the amount of violence in our societies. And a second project that I've developed comes out of that interest. It's called Three Counter Movements to Violence. And here I had the chance to work with 30 high school students in the United States to create a new public dialogue on violence. And we came up together with choreographic strategies that involved, these ones involved sound and rhythmical, physical rhythmical patterns. And the young people chose as one of their main topics the question, is there a difference between the physical punishment of children and violence? So both of these projects, in both of them, the, the participants move through a series of interactions. And they, so they move in and out of small and large groups. They use language and they use physical motion as a way to both think about and express their beliefs and their experiences. But the first time I did this project, uh, Not on Not in Frankfurt, it, was, it, did, it did not go well. It was not a hit. People, <laughs> I've never been a big fan of audience participation, actually, myself. And so I honestly did not trust that anyone would be willing to move in a public dialogue setting. So I didn't ask very much of them. And so the structure was, was stiff. And it was difficult for people to engage. So after that, I pulled my courage together and I started experimenting. And what I found is that when the choreographic strategies I use have an evident purpose, it's obvious why we're doing it, they, they function well as communication tools and they're not embarrassing, which is one of the most important things, people are not only willing to move, but they actually feel more comfortable communicating initially through motion and then it makes it easier for them to communicate through language later on. And contrary to my initial fears, one of the reasons it actually works, I've found, is that there is no audience participation because there's no audience. There's only this community of communicators. And here's how it works, for example. So imagine that there's a giant triangle in this room that you're all inside. And on either side of the triangle is either a, a video monitor or a flip chart, depending on the kind of resources we got together. And on these video monitors or flip charts, a, a series of statements come up. And you're asked to walk to the side of the triangle associated with the statement that makes the most sense to you. So let's shrink that triangle down to the size of your table. Could I ask you all to stand up? OK, I'm going to say three statements. And I'm going to ask you to um, walk to the side of the table associated with the statement that makes sense to you. So, We'll say this is position A, position B, position C, OK? So position A, violence is part of human nature. Position B, violence is learned behavior. Position C, I don't know, OK? OK, so now imagine that you go through 20 or 30 sets of statements like this where you're asked to take an actual physical stance according to your belief and experience. So standing here means this, standing there means that. And because everywhere you stand in the triangle has meaning, you're always making a choice, whether you move or not. So everyone is automatically contributing to the conversation. And we see in a really simple physical way the hard borders that we imagine sometimes existing between us on actual and metaphorical levels become less hard, become more permeable. We start to see the motion that's already taking place between us and in the room. OK, please sit down right where you are. Grab a chair. OK. Great. So. In both of these projects, there's also spoken dialogue sections. And these are also highly choreographed in a way that creates a sudden intimacy for the participants. 
And during the Not on Not project, there's also something else going on that the participants are not initially aware of. There's, people are seated four to a table. There's 25 tables. This project is set up for 100 per people per time. And the tables have been surreptitiously covered in special ink and then paper so that you can't tell it's there. So while people are speaking with each other, while they're moving toward and away from each other, gesturing, thinking with their hands, they're also leaving traces. And what emerges is 25 images like this. These are the names of the participants are on the edge. We laid these out on the floor and the people have an opportunity to walk through them, thinking together, recoding their experience through this new translation, a visual translation. So in conflict work and in choreographic work, we look at where we are, we ask ourselves what else might be possible, and then we try to figure out how to get there. So we work to create strategies that might make new movement possible. So in the interest of collectively trying to figure out how to get there, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you, and I would love to hear from you later, the following questions. From the perspective of your practice, which choreographic strategies have you tried? And what effect do you see them having? In the way that we engage with the physical thinking that's already happening in conflict, how are we either obscuring the action and the possibility in conflict, or making it visible and making it accessible? What else is possible that we have not yet noticed. Thank you very much.